Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be back here to chair the Friday briefing. COVID cases are on the rise again. According to the numbers from the Zoe COVID study, currently around 285,000 people are being infected daily in the UK, and I've just joined them. And the numbers are expected to go beyond 300,000 very soon. Along with infections, hospital admissions are also climbing, as we might expect. So this is a really important juncture right now when it comes to thinking about mitigations, especially to do with vaccines, boosters, and developing immunity with respect to the different variants. And that is going to be the central focus of our discussions today. We've got three fantastic guests to help us to discuss these issues today. Professor John Moore, Professor Maria Elena Batazzi, and Professor Rosemary Boyton. Welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us today. But before we get into that discussion, Dr. Duncan Robertson is going to present the latest COVID numbers and trends. So over to you, Duncan. Thank you. So we're very much in the uh, BA5 wave. Um, and uh, as Alice was saying, the infections are increasing, hospitalizations are increasing, uh, but also the number of people in hospital are increasing. So let's have a look at the messages for today. So very much in this BA5 wave, um, we were thinking it was a BA4 and BA5 wave, but it seems as though BA5 is taking over. Um, and infections from the ONS survey, which uh, of course comes out uh, every Friday, um, infections are increasing in all UK nations. And uh, you know Scotland is ahead of the curve um, with one in 18 testing positive, which when you think about it is, um, is a huge number. Uh, infections are increasing in all age groups, um, hospitalizations increasing, uh, number of people in hospital increasing, and number of people in mechanical ventilation beds are increasing too. And I think uh, you know it's worth kind of saying that um, at the moment we're we're getting uh, changes in the data. So the ONS uh, COVID infection survey is being reduced. The number of people who are uh, taking that survey is being reduced. People are going to be returning their swabs by post rather than by people going to their uh, their their homes. Uh, the COVID dashboard from today is now being updated weekly rather than daily. And we're in the sort of stage where we're sort of increasingly looking in the rear view mirror to see what's coming. But we do have data and we've got very good data. So we can have a look at what it is. So people testing positive. This is from the ONS survey and uh, this is the representative survey. So it's not um, affected by uh, the number of people. Uh, doing tests. And as you can see, we have uh, infections increasing uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, you know, look at uh, the blue line is Scotland. This is one in 18, as I say, which is a huge number of people testing positive. One in 25 uh, in Northern Ireland and for Scotland, uh, sorry, and for England and Wales, it's around one in 30 uh, or around 3%. So another way of looking at that is to see, um, and I think one, one thing to say actually is, is, you know, is this a surprise? Well, we've been talking about this for quite a few weeks now, and uh, UKHSA uh, published their risk assessment at the end of April for um, BA4 and BA5, and this is what this risk assessment is for. So we can see that, you know, that it, we can see by the, the data that uh, the growth advantage is there. Um, and uh, so this is this is not really a surprise. So in terms of number of people testing positive, as I say, one in 18 in Scotland, uh, one in 25 in Northern Ireland and uh, one in 30 in England and Wales. And these are increasing uh, in each uh, nation of uh, the UK, increasing over time to these really very high levels um, and increasing in each region of England over time. And you can see there's been quite a significant jump in the latest uh, data. So we are in this very much increasing stage. This looks at who is who would test positive. So this is if you're in England, uh, this is the number of people who would test positive by age. And as you can see, it's most, you know, working age population tend to be the ones that are, have the highest rates of uh, people testing positive um, with uh, 1.3% 1, 1 of uh, kind of primary school children age. So you can see there is a, there's a large difference uh, between ages, but uh, relatively high for all age groups. And this is how those numbers are changing over time. This is for England. Uh, you know, so all age groups are increasing in terms of the latest data that we have. 
This is from the ONS survey, all this data is from the ONS survey, but this is one of the things that ONS has been able to do up until now, is to look at what they call sub-regional uh, uh, levels. So this is kind of which areas of the country have the highest number of people testing positive. And as you can see, uh, Scotland is way ahead of the rest of the UK. And hopefully that will be continued. Um, it's unclear whether that sub-regional data will be available once the ONS make their changes. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting to kind of reflect on what's happening in the uh, in terms of the number of people who are kind of trying to uh, trying to reduce the spread, for example, by using face coverings that has been decreasing over time. Um, and of course, maybe now is the time for people to kind of make a kind of new assessment about the risks that they face individually. So in terms of hospital data, we're finding that uh, all age groups are increasing, but particularly at uh, Oh, certainly for adult, adults anyway. So this is the rate per 100,000 people. And as you can see, uh, the oldest age groups are going to hospital at a higher rate, but you kind of expect that. But all adults are increasing in terms of the rate that they're going to hospital. And, you know, one of the things is you think about are they going in because of COVID primarily? Are you being treated for COVID or being treated with COVID incidentally? Um, so we can see that both of those, those figures are going up, the kind of totals going up and the number of people being treated for COVID is also increasing. And this is, you know, not a good chart. This is the, the number of people who are uh, in going into mechanically ventilated beds. So these tend to be the uh, most ill. And of course, you know, with all these things, we have people who are, um, who are infected, then test positive, then go into hospital, then potentially go into mechanically ventilated beds. So there is a you know, progression in time in terms of where this data starts increasing. Um, and I think it's worth kind of putting this into perspective of the entire pandemic. So this is the uh, number of patients being admitted to hospital. So we're, we're in no way at low numbers uh, at the moment. And of course, as we have more and more variants coming along, the sort of baseline increases. So, but we are very much in this increasing stage here. Um, and also putting into perspective on the left hand side there, a number of patients in hospital, that's also rising and that puts obviously pressure on the health system. And on the right, the number of patients in hospital in mechanically ventilated beds. Vaccinations, of course, it's critical that people get as much protection as they have, and that's partly what this session is about. Um, and we can see there are still num uh, significant numbers of people who are unvaccinated, um, and that does vary across the countries. And we are in a very low number of people getting vaccinated at the moment, so very low levels. But of course, you know, what you can do to, is to protect yourself by getting vaccinated, and hopefully there'll be a more push from government on that. And in terms of variants, we are very much in this BA4, BA5 wave, that red line there at the right increasing. Uh, but if you split that down even further, uh, sorry, and actually you can see that's reflected in the number of people who are um, being infected. It does tend to go with these variants of concern as they're identified. Um, but we are in this BA4, BA5 wave. And if you split it down even further, you can see that actually the BA5 <coughs> is overtaking uh, BA4. <coughs> and I think, you know, in terms of the uh, session today, uh, you know, there are very large numbers of people who have antibodies for COVID. But of course, you can see this isn't uh, just uh, preventing people from being infected. And hopefully today's session will give um, some more, uh, more information about why that is. And uh, the other thing to say is guidance is there. This is from the UK HSA in terms of what you can do to keep yourself and your loved ones safe. Get vaccinated, let the fresh air in with ventilation, consider wearing, wearing a face covering, stay at home if you're unwell and hand washing. So this is the guidance that's there from UK HSA, uh, but of course that doesn't tend to be emphasized and amplified as much as perhaps it could be. So the summaries for today, uh, we're very much in this BA5 wave, Increase, uh, infections are increasing in all um, uh, UK nations, with Scotland ahead with a huge number of one in 18 who would test positive. Infections are increasing in all age groups, increasing hospitalizations, increasing people of number of people in hospital and in mechanically ventilated beds. And we are at this stage where we are, uh, we are going through a period of, of less data being available with the ONS COVID infection survey uh, deteriorating in terms of its quality and the COVID dashboard uh, being updated weekly 
rather than daily. So we are still looking in the rearview mirror to see what's coming ahead. Thank you very much for that, Duncan. Um, very, very clear presentation of all the facts and figures there. And uh, as we move into this wave, well, we're in it, aren't we? So um, now we're going to move on to the main session on vaccines and immunity. And I'm going to invite Professor Sheena Cruikshank and Professor Danny Altman to kick off that session. Over to you. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, so I'd just like to thank, um, start by thanking our guests today, the Professor Rosemary Boyton, who's a Professor of Immunology and Respiratory Medicine at Imperial College London, Professor John Moore, who's a Professor of Microbiology and Immunology at Coral Medicine in New York, and we also have Professor Maria Elena Patazzi, who is the co-director of the Texas Children's um, Hospital Centre for Vaccine Development, um, and is also um, um, in Baylor Collar College of Medicine in Texas, USA as well. Um, so I'm going to start by asking um, Rosemary some questions. So Rosemary's done some really pivotal and, and absolutely critical um, work looking at immunity to COVID and what's been happening with the variants. So Rosemary, do you think you could tell us a little bit about some of your work, please? Yeah, sorry, apologies. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. I think there's three key concepts I'd like to get across. Um, the first concept is about binding immunity where people get their ancestral antibody serology tested. Um, and what I'd say about that is there's almost no correlation whatsoever between your ancestral binding antibody level um, and what kind of neutralizing antibody response you might make against a variant of concern. Um, there's absolutely no correlation with Omicron neutralization from live virus. So that's the first concept to get on board. What those binding antibodies are telling you is how well you've responded to the vaccines because the vaccines all contain a sequence from spikes that's from the ancestral strain. So that's telling you that you've made a very good response to the vaccination. Now, the reason people aren't dying and getting seriously ill who've been vaccinated three or four times is because what that's done is it's built up cellular and antibody immunity where there is a kind of headroom of protection um, so although your immune response against the variants is not as good as against the ancestral strain, it's kind of good enough. Um, and so it's enough to protect you from hospitalization and death. It doesn't protect you from infection. But what's happened is as we've gone through the variants from alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and now Omicron, the amount of cross-react immunity has, re has reduced. And with Omicron, there was a huge gear change where the amount of escape, vaccine escape, um, was substantially increased. So when you look at, um, say, three-dose vaccinated people and you look at their cross-reactive immunity um, against Omicron, it's, it's substantially lower in cellular immunity and antibody immunity than against the previous variants. <clears throat> and the next important thing to get is that you know, Omicron itself doesn't boost your immunity very well at all. So if you have an Omicron infection and you've never had an infection before, um, and you've been three dose vaccinated, you will make some cross reactive immunity against the previous variants, but you'll make very poor cross reactive immunity against Omicron itself. And that's one of the reasons why people getting an Omicron infection is not protecting them very well at all from reinfection or breakthrough infection. And that's a big problem. And then the third concept that I'd like to get across to everybody is about immune imprinting. So what we mean by immune imprinting is that the immune repertoire that each individual has in the population, or indeed each population around the globe has, is a function of infection and vaccination. So everybody's got a different pathway of infections that they've had and numbers of vaccine doses that they've had. And that imprints their immune response against an incoming variant. Um, so there'll be some patterns of immunity that protect you more and some that protect you less, depending on which infection you've had and which vaccines you've had. So somebody in South Africa who'd been infected with beta might have a different imprinted immune response to someone in Britain who's been um, infected with alpha and had three vaccine doses. Um, and that's a really important concept. So one of the most scary findings, I think, from our research that we recently published in Science 
was that um, if someone had been infected in the first wave with an ancestral strain of the virus and then had three vaccine doses and then got infected with Omicron, they couldn't boost their immune response at all, not their cellular or their antibody immune response. And so that, that's what the problem is. We've got these immune imprinted repertoires that are different for different people, depending on what they've been exposed to. So there isn't a kind of one size fits all uh, for how we move forward in terms of trying to protect populations and individuals. And I'm going to stop there so someone can ask me some questions. And I think that's that was really clear. Thank you, Rosemary. And I think that's really important, isn't it? Because I think one of the the, the confusing bits of information that comes over is that that you know the ONS have just published that you know ninety nine percent or so of us all have antibodies, mm. but actually in terms of protection, what you're saying and what your your research is showing mm. that actually doesn't equate to protection. No, and it, it, what it doesn't do is it doesn't correlate in any way to the amount of immune protection against a particular variant that you've got. It tells you how well you've responded to the vaccine. So if you've got good levels, that's good, because it means you've made a good response to the vaccine. So it means you will have some cross-reactive immunity. And that's why people are being protected from, you know, you know, death and getting seriously ill. And that's why people should continue to get vaccinated, because that's a good thing. Um, but what it's not telling you is that you've got a great antibody response, you're going to be fine. And you can't say I've got 20,000 bloody blahs, I'm okay, I, I don't need to worry. Because you you could you could still be making no neutralizing antibody responses against Omicron. So for example, 14 weeks after the third vaccine dose, healthy people were not making any neutralizing antibodies against Omicron whatsoever. Um, so what that means is when they get infected, they have to make some new antibodies with their memory B cells that then sort of help protect them and also they've got their t-cell responses so what ba4 and ba5 have done is they've made it's made it worse because ba4 and ba5 there's le even less cross-reactive immunity um so you've got even less protection and it, i would predict that the omicron infection isn't protecting you from the ba4 or ba5 either and of course what this means is that there's always going to be a little lag while our immune system gets a chance to start making and generating those antibodies from exactly. the pre-existing memory cells. Exactly. Of course, that's the reason why we start to feel unwell. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I thought was really important, really fascinating about your work was this imprinting idea and this idea that whatever infection we've had is going to dictate how, how we would respond. So is it fair to say then that if you had the, the sort of original strains that you might feel a little worse if you get the Omicron strains? Is, is that fair to say? Would that yeah, I, 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 knew, I knew someone would ask me these questions because people always want to say, if I got Delta, what does it mean? If I got Alpha, what does it mean? <laughs> it's very, very complicated, actually. And I, I genuinely mean that. I'm not just saying it. it's very, very complicated. And you've got very complicated repertoires. What I can say is that if someone's had an alpha infection, for example, their um, antibody responses against Omicron wane much quicker, for example, compared to someone who's had an ancestral infection. Um, but um, what it's all really about, I mean, um, one of the ways we always try and describe this to, to lay people is like having a smarty jar full of colored smarties and you get an infection and then you've got some smarties with a certain color that's expanded and your repertoire's expanded. Um, and then perhaps if you get another infection, you get a different colored set of Smarties that have expanded and then you get your vaccinations. So everything gets sort of jigged around a bit more. And then in comes a new variant and the person with the red Smarties is better off and more protected than the person with the blue Smarties. So they don't get sick or as sick. And, 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 and that's, that's the kind of problem you've got. It's a complex situation. You can't have a one size fits all. And you've got to kind of take into account immune imprinting when you're thinking about the antibody responses and the antibody repertoires. And this will become very important when we're trying to work out what sequences to use in future vaccines to future proof um, uh, protection in, in, uh, as, as we move forward. And I, I think our next guest is going to be expanding on that idea about the future vaccines. I've got one last question for you, Rosemary, just a quickie. What do you think about the sort of duration of the antibody response? Again, because that's another thing that people keep talking about. They talk about the levels of antibodies yeah. and the duration of the response. And do you think these are helpful concepts or not? Yeah, so 
I think it's a helpful concept in the sense that if you look through the different vaccine dosings, as people get to the third encounter with the spike, they reach their maximum plateau. So you can't boost them above that plateau. So there's no point in just giving them more and more and more. It's pointless. But once they've got to their plateau, they then start to wane. And so you can get differential waning. And it is meaningful to understand waning because that's going to give you some idea about scheduling vaccines in the future, um, as in timing, you know, when you might need to revaccinate your population. But there's definitely differential waning depending on which variant you've been infected by. Um, so again, there won't be a one size fits all for that. And obviously it will be different when you're thinking about people who've got immunosuppression or are taking immunosuppressive drugs who may not have made as good a vaccine response. Um, and uh, one of the important areas of research that people are now going into is trying to understand how we can maximally boost people um, when, when they're having their vaccination by, um, you know, interrupting, say, their, their doses of drugs and things like that to try and enhance their vaccine responses, which is very, very important. It is indeed. Thank you, Rosemary. I'm just going to pass over now to my colleague, Danny, who's going to um, take our next guest. Hello. So um, for anybody who doesn't know um, John Moore, can I just introduce him as a, a famous viral immunologist who spent many decades looking, um, I guess, primarily at neutralization of HIV and you know, more recently at the world of COVID. And one of the things he's done in, in COVID times is to perform this really heroic task for the community, doing a really comprehensive encyclopedic review of the literature every single week of hundreds of papers that have kept us all really, really on board. Um, so, so John, hi, with, with all that enormous um, brain wattage and, and knowledge on board, um, you know, you've heard, you know, obviously we're not in a good situation, particularly in the UK at the moment, from all that data we just looked at, both in terms of, you know, BA5 prevalence and vaccine uptake. And we don't have much discussion even about where next for vaccines and vaccine campaigns. Just paint us a picture of how you think things look at the moment in the USA in terms of where next for vaccines and the next generation. Sure, thanks, Tony. So I'm in Manhattan in New York City. The US population is about five or six times greater than the UK. So you've got to divide these numbers uh, proportionately. The reported infection rates in the states are around 120,000 a day, uh, which is underreported because people don't report at home testing, probably the same as you guys don't. Uh, we have around 30,000 people in hospitals, 3,000 in ICUs, and we're losing around 350 people a day. So they're the kinds of numbers in the pandemic. At the moment, we're seeing BA4 and BA5 um, becoming dominant. They're on the way up, replacing BA2, BA12.1, et cetera. So we're perhaps a month behind where you are in terms of BA4 and BA5. Vaccination rates are lower in the US than in the UK, uh, particularly in the Trumpy parts of the country, which have been, you know, where they get a lot of anti-vaxxer propaganda and believe it. Uh, uptake of dose three most of the vaccinations in the states are the mrnas pfizer and moderna there's very little use of any other vaccine um, so very proportionately disappointing number of people have taken the third dose that has been available for a considerable period of time so it's relatively under vaccinated country compared to uh, the uk it's not ridiculous but it's it's a, certainly a significant difference and a significant lower level. And of course, most of the deaths at the moment are in the Trumpy parts of the country because they involve unvaccinated or under-vaccinated people. That's just where we are. So the major event this week was an FDA open committee meeting on Tuesday to discuss the composition change of the American vaccine program uh, for a rollout later in the year, perhaps in November, that kind of period. It was very data light, a very disappointingly poor quality of discussion because there's not a lot of immunology expertise on the FDA committee, uh, which is just the nature of where we are, how it runs here. The decision essentially had been taken by FDA officials weeks before, so there was a strong whiff of rubber stamping going on at the meeting. 
there were short five to 10 minute presentations from Moderna, which was on the used car salesman level, very disappointing in terms of its content. Uh, Pfizer, which was actually a, quite a good and professional discussion and data presentation. And Novavax, which isn't actually yet authorized in the States, but they're still in the game here. Um, and that seemed interesting, but it contained data that no one had seen before that was flashed up for five seconds at a time when you're trying to work out what the hell it means in, in real time. Um, and then the discussion's really quite poor. The outcome is that on yesterday, FDA issued a press release saying that the next vaccine rollout in the USA would be a bivalent vaccine with a BA4-5 component to supplement the standard Wuhan original sequence-based vaccine. Um, and the data supporting this are, well, you know, close to non-existent and somewhat contradictory to what was shown at the meeting where Pfizer, for example, showed a limited data set that the bivalent vaccine was less immunogenic than the monovalent in terms of antibodies against BA4 and BA5. So we're all, you know, head scratching. Well, not everyone's head scratching, but there's a certain amount of reservation. I mean, the FDA has to make educated guesswork. I'm some, somewhat sympathetic that they have to make a decision now to allow manufacture and rollout in time for usage in, you know, the November, December period. But it, the, the, the quality and quantity of the data that it's being made on is really not that great. And, and we're seeing what Rosemary, in the vaccine studies, we're seeing what Rosemary has said, that the, 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 the studies that have been done to date in, in monkeys earlier in the year and in humans very recently, and mostly science by press release, show that whatever you boost with, you don't see much of a difference because of immune imprinting, original antigenic sin, if you wish, uh, in the sense that if you boost people with the standard original vaccine and you compare it with a BA1 vaccine, which is all that's been studied to date, you only see a twofold increase in antibodies against Omicron when you use the Omicron vaccine. When you compare it, it's a, a twofold a benefit of Omicron compared to the standard boost. Both, both cause boosting effects, but the Omicron booster, BA1, is only slightly better. And that, again, is down to imprinting. So the question then is, what does a twofold increase in, in neutralizing antibody titer actually mean? It doesn't mean it's twice as good a vaccine. It doesn't mean it's twice as protective. And there are models available, particularly uh, Miles Davenport in Melbourne, Australia, that can be used to model the effect of a twofold difference in neutralizing antibody levels. FDA is aware of them and simply hasn't used them. So there we are. A decision has been taken. It is based on I, what I think is educated or semi-educated guesswork. It may or may not turn out to be a good one, but that's what's going to happen. So let me ask you a quick add-on question before we go back to Sheena and, and, and the, the next speaker. So. So we've got the UK where there's essentially no follow on vaccine policy and the USA where you're describing one that kind of flies in the face of, of, of any data or you know, immunological logic. Um, if you were in charge, you know, where, where should we go next? Well, well, Paul Offit, who's a very distinguished vaccinologist, and I, he was on the committee and he was only one of only two of 21 people who voted against the motion to change to an Omicron. I mean, you know, we've talked a fair amount about this and wrote an article in, in STAT, and he was against the move. I was more agnostic. What I was wanting to see was a more informed discussion among leading immunologists and modelers such as Miles Davenport to assess the available data in a more thorough manner than happened at the FDA meeting, which was seriously immunologically light. So I was saying, look, you know, I get the need for make a decision in the immediate future. We're not saying let's come back in a couple of months, but take a week and, and, and have a serious discussion of what are the available data. I mean, they're being flashed on a screen in an open committee meeting. You're trying to get to understand them. Then they move on to the next slide and, and you're just going, what, what's going on here? 
And, and Moderna and Pfizer had contradictory data on bivalent boosters, where Moderna was claiming that their bivalent booster was better than monovalent, and Pfizer was saying it's worse, um, probably because they're using half as much. When you put doing bivalent, you're having half as much of each, so you're reducing your active vaccine concentration for Omicron. So, you know, what is the definitive data set? We don't know. It's, I just wanted them to take some more time and have a wider consultation uh, as to what the data mean, because you're taking a multi-billion dollar decision affecting hundreds of millions of people. And, and as I said earlier, there was a strong whiff of the FDA officials that decided several weeks ago and just simply needed a rubber stamp. That's that's really um, sobering slash alarming. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Let's go back to Sheena to introduce another view of the, the vaccine landscape. All right. Well, thank you, Danny. One of the things we've been talking about has really been focused on the UK and the USA. And of course, a lot of these vaccines that we're talking about are based around the spike protein. The spike protein is the bits on the virus that the virus uses to get into our cells. So it's a really logical target for us to be vaccinating against. And also that is the bit that's tending to be mutated in some of these new variants, particularly the Omicron variant. So that's why there's so much conversation about the utility of the different vaccines. But whilst the UK and the US have had plenty of access to vaccines, we've got a burning issue across the world. We still have many countries with very, very poor or no access to vaccines. And that's why I'm so delighted to introduce our next guest, Maria Elena Botazzi, who's been doing some absolutely critical work to really start to address some of these questions around vaccine equity and how we get vaccines out across the world. So Maria, please, can you tell us a little bit about your work? Uh, well, thank you so much, Sheena and everybody for the invitation. And it's just amazing to hear uh, the perspectives of the prior uh, presenters. So um, uh, so we, we are a group that um, is based in Houston, Texas, but that we specialized for many years, in fact, for two decades on developing vaccine prototypes and vaccine partnerships for um, neglected um, diseases of poverty type of uh, um, interventions. Um, 10 years ago, believe it or not, we adopted within our vaccine uh, development portfolio coronaviruses, uh, initially SARS and later MERS, because believe it or not, we were seeing that they were becoming neglected, neglected in prioritizing them to study more the, you know, the virus itself and their interactions with us, the hosts, uh, and neglected in um, investments in R&D, right, in research and development to be prepared, right, for these uh, interventions. So in our adoption into our vaccine development programs, um, we always had in the back of our minds that if we were to, uh, God forbid, have another outbreak, which now, unfortunately, we even had a, even worse, a, a global pandemic, we needed to um, enable, prepare, and evaluate how, if we were to indeed you know, develop a vaccine, um, that this could um, not only uh, reach the populations in need locally, of course, in our own countries, um, but especially those underserved, underserved um, poor um, um, people in our own country, but also abroad. Um, and our strategy has always been at the level not only of accessibility and affordability, but also manufacturability and scalability. And even though you have heard about um, you know, wonderful um, work and uh, effectiveness and certainly usability of new technologies, you know, so vaccine technology matters, you know, the RNA technology, the viral vector technology, which albeit they have been studied for years, they have, they're relatively new, they're new uh, on how to make them, they're new on how to even uh, us understanding it as people. Um, and that has, you know, in, inculcated some level of hesitance, you know, it's understandable. 
Um, we opted instead to focus on um, prototyping vaccine technologies that use already very well known uh, ways of making and using vaccines, which in our case is recombinant protein or subunit vaccines. To give you examples, these are vaccines that um, have been used previously safely, even in populations, in pediatric populations like the hepatitis B vaccine. But I think for us, it was more important that we had an ecosystem of manufacturability around the world because we thought that as we were developing these new technologies in countries like the US, the UK, you know, and Canada and Australia and others, that we should have also an option um, that you know, uh, could be made indigenously in, in low middle income countries, but that also it would reduce the uh, cost burdens you know, to have to acquire. Um, and uh, we opted then for a protein-based vaccine, which is relatively similar to the example of Novavax that we heard earlier. Novavax makes a protein particle vaccine, but not a subunit, a small piece. We also uh, focus on the receptor binding domain, as you mentioned, it's, it's, a, it's a small component within the spike protein. And um, certainly, evidence in our laboratories preclinically had shown even from the days of SARS and MERS that there was a potential for it. Unfortunately, they were not very well um, um, uh, accepted within the policy and financial uh, groups. But we now have, uh, in our case, a recombinant protein vaccine that is now being scaled in India. Uh, it's actually being also now manufactured in Indonesia. You know, it's very affordable, it's very scalable, and slowly we're now seeing some evidence of what their value would be to bring it into the space of um, the different vaccine technology options that we have. Uh, a couple of examples that I can uh, already give you some uh, um, preliminary uh, uh, evidence is in the, in, the, in the fact that protein-based vaccines can be formulated very uh, intelligently with some immunostimulants that may help this uh, situation of imprinting, that may help in the durability and um, reducing the, the waning that we have been seeing with RNA viral vectors um, and even whole inactivated virus vaccines. So I think that there's a, um, a very good promise of the protein-based vaccines as a future, but it also brings this promise of the coverage um, that, you know, as you alluded, you know, we have some uh, issues in countries like UK and certainly the US, but we have enormous issue of coverages, you know, globally. Uh, where countries, uh, there are many countries that haven't even received a single dose. Um, that is um, paired with the hesitance situation where, you know, even uh, we now have in many of these low middle income countries, not even a vaccine supply issue, we even have an excess uh, of vaccines, but people just do not want to use them because of, you know, um, you know untrust, uh, maybe they're seeing, you know, reflected in the fact that you know, like you're, we're seeing that, you know, the people may think that it, they don't work anymore, that what's the point of me getting vaccinated if I'm already getting infected, you know, they see themselves that there may not be a value. We actually did a study with a group of uh, health economists at the Central University of New York, uh, where we actually did develop a model, a computational uh, economic model, where we see that even incremental gains of 1% coverages of vaccination could not only avert certainly death, uh, hospitalizations, but it could really also not only save in direct medical, indirect costs, but it would really provide measurable um, impact in preventing um, uh, the arise of these new variants. And I think that's the, 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 the concern that we have, that we are going to be putting all our eggs now in the BA45 basket, and by the fall, it may be another variant, and we would be starting from, from scratch. So I think the message then is we still need to vaccinate the world. The promise is maybe these subunit type of vaccines that are affordable and that are scalable and might be more acceptable. And we know that, of course, now they're safe and protective in the backbone of you know, the variants that we have. Second is that we still need to, you know, there's value in coverage. 
There's value in incremental coverages to provide, of course, um, you know, certainly benefit to our population and to reduce the um, generation of new variants, especially in the areas that we don't have. And then third is that we really need to um, address the hesitance problem that we have around the world. And, and um, you know, things like we're doing now to, to bring awareness to our, you know, communities is important. Um, and the third, and maybe the fourth, the last one is in the first presentation, we saw that there may still be a need to uh, go back to some level of um, non-pharmaceutical interventions like you know, distancing and masking. And I think we've also shown in uh, various, again, modeling studies that if we could keep a little longer, especially the uh, mask usage, uh, it goes a long, long way especially in the areas where we see now that the variants are so highly transmissible. So Sheena, I'm gonna just send it back to you and um, see if there's any other questions. Thank you so much, Maria Elena. That was really valuable to get that global perspective and the way that we need to all work together, the value of manufacture in, in other countries and the importance of working with communities to address vaccine hesitancy. Now, I know we've got questions from the public, and um, so our experts are going to stay with us. And I'm going to pass over now to Alice Roberts, who's going to share the wider questions. Thank you so much to our wonderful guests. Yes, thank you very much indeed. That was that was just fantastic. Really wonderful. And we have got a few questions from the public here. The first one is from Maya Wolf, which I'm going to read out. The question is, is protection against infection still better from a natural infection or from the old vaccines we're still using? Will any sort of antibody, whether from infection or vaccine, protect us against future infection? Or are we just trying to avoid death and hospitalizations now, which currently still is going up a lot, so protection isn't good enough either with the amount of antibodies in the population? So, uh, I mean, I think we covered that um, a little bit in that discussion, but I wonder if um, I could come back to you, Rosemary, Professor Rosemary Boynton, on, on that particular point. Yeah, um, so I, I think that's a very good point. So with vaccines, in an ideal world, we'd like to have sterilising immunity. So what that means is people don't get infected with the virus at all. Um, I actually think the COVID-19 vaccines were fantastic. They worked incredibly well, better than we'd ever predicted. Uh, but they didn't achieve sterilizing immunity. Um, so, so we're in a position where what they've achieved is, you know, less severe disease and, and, and less death, which is good, um, but not ideal. So in an ideal world, you would want to try and future proof your vaccine strategies to end up with sterilizing immunity if possible. That's actually not very easy with coronaviruses because of the nature of the virus. Um, so I think the next part of the question was relating to the ancestral strain. So the ancestral sequence is obviously the first sequence that we found in the first wave. Um, and since then, um, little bits of the spike have mutated and changed over time. So um, the variance responses are slightly less good, but the cross-reactive responses, which is the response that you get against the variant that has been learnt from being exposed to the ancestral strain are actually very, very good on the whole and still protecting people. So, um, so I think what I'm saying is that the ancestral strain vaccination is still a good option. Um, it's not a terrible option, but it's it would be nice if we could have more effective vaccines that were better at future proofing against future variants or against future spillover from animals to humans from bats or pangolins or, or, or other animal species that also can get infected with coronavirus. So I, I think it's a complex question. I hope I've answered it. Um, I do think there's a lot of work to be done to try and develop better um, vaccine design to improve future proofing. And the key thing that you want to achieve in your vaccine design is to broaden your repertoire, not contract your repertoire. So the thing that I find slightly alarming about John Moore's presentation if I might say so, is that if you if you could try contracting by just going for the Omicron sequence, um, that doesn't essentially seem like a great plan to me, because if you look at what's happened in infection is when people get infected by Omicron, and that's the whole virus, not just the spike sequence, they're not boosting their response at all. Also, when you look in the studies that 
that have been done, they've been done in the context of infection naive individuals. So that's people who've never been exposed to an infection. And that's both in the animal studies that um, John was alluding to, and also in the vaccine studies that, that, that the companies do, because they always try to pick infection naive individuals. And what the immune imprinting thing is telling us is that your infection history matters. Um, so the other scary thing is that if you've been imprinted by a, a, an ancestral strain infection and then you have an Omicron vaccination with an Omicron sequence, you might not boost at all, um, a bit like with the infection. So I think it's a very complex question and we've really got to really get our heads down and try and work really hard to, to improve um, the design of our future-proof vaccines. Thank you very much indeed for, for that, Raise Me. Uh, John, I wondered if you wanted to add anything there, Professor John Moore. I mean, uh, it was very interesting hearing what you were saying about, you know, trying to trying to work out where we go with with vaccines in the future. I mean, do you do you have any hope? Do you hold any hope for a, a sterilising vaccine at any point? Or, or is that is that just, you know, a, a whim now? Well, not with the current generation of vaccines, because they're not immunogenic enough to get antibody responses into a range that they can deal with something as resistant as the Omicron lineage. And because so many people are now antigenically experienced in UK, USA, Western European high vaccine and infection countries, uh, we're not dealing with a naive population anymore. So, you know, yes, there are highly immunogenic um, next generation vaccines in trials from you know, multiple groups, and some of them look pretty good in animal and early study, early human studies, but they're a long way from approval and rollout. So, and then there's a lot of work being done on mucosal vaccines, which, when delivered nasally, give better local mucosal responses, but they're not very good for systemic immunity, although some of them are given in a nasal prime muco uh, nasal prime uh, intramuscular boost format that seems to be the best option so but again none of them is going to be approved for use within you know a year or two so it's it's not 2020 anymore vaccines are not approved in six months like they were in 2020. Thank you very much John uh, do any of the Indie Sage panel want to come in on this one Steve Steve Griffin? Yeah I'm um... It's, it's absolutely right what's been said, but I think that we really do need to think about this this almost myth that's built around the fact that that being exposed and infected by this virus is preferable to having a vaccine. Um, you know, we have this long checkered history of immunological um, diversity in this country now because of infection, but it's never ideal to be infected by this virus. We see breakthrough infections and reinfections, which can go either way. Obviously, most people won't have a severe disease course as they had previously, but some might. And then the other aspect, of course, is long COVID. And we also have, as Duncan showed at the beginning of the, of the broadcast, a significant number of people that haven't been vaccinated and primarily children. So we really need to ensure that children get their vaccines as soon as we possibly can, because the children don't tend to make a very good response to infection at all. So that really is a bit of a a loss and a risk for these children that are being exposed in schools as we speak now. Thank you very much, Steve. I mean, I think I suppose the important thing to say is that um, around all these concerns that we, we might have uh, about the vaccines and, and where vaccines go in the future, it is absolutely worth getting vaccinated, um, getting boosted, um, and that is always better than, the, than getting infected. Um, so, I'm going to invite another um, member of the public to come and uh, read us a question now. It's a question on behalf of Joe Woods being asked by Sabrina. Sabrina, are you with us? Yeah, hi. Hi, it's Sabrina. Hi. Oh, Sabrina, hello. <laughs> no, hi. Um, so I'll ask, um, there's kind of two parts to this question. Um, so I understand that the BA4 and BA5 variants are targeting the lungs rather than the upper respiratory airways that previous Omicron variants have done. So should people with asthma be concerned about this, considering that for many, their boosters were at least seven months ago? And the second element of that question is, do you think in your professional opinions that all people with asthma who are on the annual free flu jab list should be included in the autumn COVID booster program? And I'm just gonna add here, um, something that Joe didn't say, but I wanted to add this uh, because of the, the kind of audience that are here, um, is that we know that asthma incidence 
differs across characteristics. We know that people in the most deprived parts of the country experience asthma at higher rates. We know that Black, Asian and minority ethnic people have higher, higher amounts of asthma as well in their communities. So I think there's something here about the fact that we need to include all of those people in the booster programme. So those are my two questions on behalf of Joe Woods. Thank you. Thank you very much, Safrina. Um, Steve, I saw that you had your hand up there to answer, so you can start. Yeah, thanks, Safrina. It's a really important question, and I'll just address the first part, if I may. So, um, yes, there was a study from the Sato Lab, from the Japanese uh, G2P consortium, that showed using um, a, a sort of very quick system to look at these changes in these, in these variants, which is to take the backbone from another virus, a very similar virus, another Omicron-related virus, and put the new spike protein into that system. And they showed in that study that, that yes, this did seem to affect the ability of the virus to go into these more deeper lung cells than the, the other Omicron variants. Now, the caveat to that is that we don't, at the moment, have published data on um, the full viral sequence acting um, in concert you know, with all of its genes. So that's really important to see first before we decide that's definitely going to be the case. Um, but there has been a slight uptick in, in hospitalisation rates associated with infection with this. So it really is early days to say, I think the opinion of UKHSA is that it possibly isn't as bad as the Sato paper might make out. So I think we should watch this space and I'll let someone else answer the next part of the question. Thanks very much, Steve. Dr Zubeda Hack, you wanted to um, come in on this question. I think certainly in terms of vulnerability, Sabrina, you have um, some excellent points there, not only in terms of asthma, but also in terms of the fact that we've always known that the risk factors for those living in deprived areas, um, you know, sort of poorer socioeconomic areas from black and ethnic minority groups, those immunocompromised compromised and so on, we've always known that the risk factors for those groups have been very high. The risk factors for people living in overcrowded housing is very high. And I think what's extraordinary at the moment is we're behaving as though those risk factors because of vaccines have all disappeared. And yet we know that people in deprived areas, that in some of in some of the black and ethnic minority groups, that vaccination take up is lower. There's a bit more vaccine hesitancy. We haven't completely addressed that. So we are in this extraordinary situation where the risk factors are pretty much the same. Um, right now, infection rates, as Duncan has shown us, are extremely high, um, and that's extremely concerning. So, yes, the answer to your question is yes, we should be thinking about, you know, increasing um, boosters for those groups, especially as we've seen that take up has gone down, um, has gone down a lot and waning has gone down a lot. Thank you very much. I mean, do we have any um, clarity now on, on whether asthma is a, is a risk factor for um, a worse experience of COVID? Because I think the, um, the data seems to have been quite um, ambiguous over the course of the pandemic. And certainly asthmatics were, um, were included in um, early groups for, for being vaccinated um, very, very early on and then booted out of them. Um, and, and we've gone through this kind of whole discussion about whether if you're offered an annual flu jab, um, as you said, Safrina, uh, whether you should be offered a, a COVID booster. Uh, Anthony Costello, Professor Anthony Costello. I can't answer the asthma question, but there's a paper out today in the New England Journal of Medicine, which suggests that um, the Omicron infections cause double the numbers of cases of croup in young children. That's an upper respiratory fat scary problem where you you know and uh, a lot of children uh, do seem to get that so it is it, it is targeting the upper respiratory tract in a different way since i've the floor can i just say one other thing which relates to maria's points because she in her brilliant lab has come up with a vaccine that could be sent around the world but after 18 months we've had effective vaccines for 18 months 86 percent of people in low-income countries are not fully vaccinated. 83% have had no vaccination at all. And we know that 90% of the costs of the vaccines that we've got were borne by taxpayers and philanthropists. And this week, Oxfam called for a 90% windfall tax on the profits of vaccine companies, which would raise, believe it or not, a staggering $490 billion which could help a lot with the rising 
food security and hunger amongst children across the entire world post pandemic. Now we know that that tax won't happen because shareholders are much more important than children in our current value systems. And But now to add to that, the World Bank are now lending large sums of our taxpayers' money to low-income countries so that they can afford to buy the expensive vaccines from these big farmers. You know, they've just lent $450 million to South Africa to buy these vaccines. So the irony is that taxpayers' money is again being spent on increasing shareholder returns and at the same time increasing debt in low-income countries. This is global corruption and a grotesque moral failure. And I'm quoting Gordon Brown. I, I mean, I really think this is a scandal and uh, it's very tied up with immunity. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, Alice, may I just uh, uh, expand a little bit on that? Since yes, of course. You know, uh, kindly Anthony mentioned that indeed, I think we are seeing an enormous a human failure, especially in the area of policy failure. And, and I think that indeed is what needs to change, right? Is this concept that vaccine development, deployment, and even acceptance is tied very heavily on the model that only through uh, large multinational corporations, you can achieve um, uh, accessibility and, and certainly, um, uh, uh, you know, development of vaccines for the public good. And I think that's what our group has in partnership with like-minded producers, in our case, Biological E, BioPharma and others, try to break that paradigm and really show that um, we can you know, make vaccines that are certainly safe, effective, um, indigenously in regions that they already have a vaccine ecosystem of production and, and that uh, that it can be done even bypassing the traditional multinational framework. That doesn't mean that the multinational framework is not needed or 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 is or has to complement, but it cannot just only be skewed to that that effect. And I think that taxpayers' dollars that you're uh, um, mentioning, which also, of course, from the U.S., we have the same uh, um, scenario should be also be used to balance, you know, that decolonization, right? You know, is that we need to really empower those who can contribute and have them sit around the table equally, even as uh, stakeholders in this um, um, arena. And so I think that hopefully this, you know, wakes up a little bit the, you know, more the conversations amongst policymakers and those decision makers. And not all the decisions have to come out of the US, the UK, the Geneva, Seattle, right? You know, uh, uh, it has to also come, you know, a, a grain, you know, um, grassroots from the countries and the regions that need it. So back to you, Alice. Thank you very much indeed, Maria. And um, thank you for that question, uh, Safrina. I want to squeeze in another couple of questions before we wrap up for today. And I know that Frank Friedman is here with us and has a question as well. So Frank, over to you. Oh, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to ask a question. Um, and I think it, I think it's probably been answered to some extent, but I'd, I'd like to have a, uh, a better idea. Um, and I, I, what I'm wondering is I, I, I haven't had COVID uh as far as i know um and i uh, have avoided uh indoor public spaces but i do have to go shopping i've got uh, quite a long hospital appointment coming up uh where i know that there's limited mitigations and protections so uh, i must have passively inhaled plenty of coronavirus particles I imagine, I can't, I, can't, I can't believe that there haven't been anywhere I've been. Um, so what I, what I want to know is, does, does that give any sort of passive or vicarious vaccination effect? If, you, if, you're, getting, if you're getting some live virus, but not enough to make you ill, does that have a, a vaccination effect with it at all? Thank you. Uh, so great question. So can can asymptomatic infection, even if you've never tested positive, um, if you if you have been asymptomatically infected, could that uh, lead to any kind of immunity? 
who would like to start with with that particular one Sheena okay. It's a, that's a really interesting question. And I think, I think it comes down to this, this idea. So I assume you've been vaccinated because that's absolutely critical. If you've been vaccinated, you should already have a pool of, of memory cells that know how to react. You may have good levels of neutralizing antibody. And there has been a theory for some types of viruses, particularly coronaviruses, that sometimes our immune system just needs a little refresher. So if we do, if that is correct, I'm not saying that we 100% know it's correct for, for, for SARS-CoV-2, which causes um, COVID, um, then what it could mean, if we've already got that level of memory cells, we've got that level of neutralizing antibodies circulating in our blood, that, that every now and then it's like a little bit of refresher homework that just tops that back up again, but we've always kept that level of neutralizing antibody and memory high enough that we don't actually get an active infection. That's the only really way I could see it working. I think without any of that background protection that our memory and our neutralizing antibodies are giving us, then it just takes one viral particle to get into your body to replicate and replicate and replicate and make you very, very mm. unwell. You need that background. They're very sneaky and they're very fast. Thank you for that, Sheena. I wonder if anybody else would like to comment on this. Um, John, I wondered if, uh, wondered if uh, well, you had a perspective on this question. There are international consortia now looking at variation in human susceptibility to, in, to coronavirus infection. And of course, it's now extremely difficult to do because so many people have been vaccinated or were infected. So you don't have an unexposed population. But, you know, there must be considerable natural variation in people's susceptibility to infection, even given exposure. Um, I mean, you know, pre-pandemic, we all had friends who got every respiratory virus that ever went around. Every winter they went down with something. And we had friends or, or ourselves who never got a cold, never got the flu, seemed relatively bulletproof. And that's natural variation in, in host innate immunity, interferons and other ward, ways in which we ward off infections. So, but it's not been teased out. And yet there are serious international consortia trying to do this because I think that's an extremely important area of science. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and thank you for that question, Frank. And we did have a few other questions, but I think actually a lot of the points have already been covered um, in the brilliant discussion that we had at the beginning of today's session. So I am going to uh, wrap it all up for today. Uh, thank you very much to all of our guests for, for that discussion and also for sticking around for the questions as well. That's been invaluable. Uh, and thank you to all the other panellists as well, of course, for their observations. Thank you to the members of public who have sent in their questions. Uh, we'll be on a break next week, but Independence Age will be back with a Friday briefing after that. Meanwhile, stay safe and take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.